welcome everybody to the 2023 Todd Fisher Lectureship. I am Doug Miller, Professor and Chair of the Department of Traditional Sciences, and I'm so happy to see you all here today. It's a beautiful day outside. We're gathered here at what will undoubtedly be an inspired and thought provoking seminar, and we're not on strike anymore. What could be better? Before I say uh, a few words about uh, the lectureship and introduce um, our uh, lectureship namesake and introduce our guest speaker, let me first hand the podium over to Executive Dean of the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences, Laura Lawson, who will uh, have a few words of welcome. Um, welcome. Happy Earth Day, Monday early. Um, it's very exciting to be here today and on such a beautiful day. Hopefully later they can open up the back. Um, for you to just enjoy this beautiful spring day. Um, it does definitely feel like we've turned over into a new season, and, and it's absolutely delightful um, to be here. So it is my pleasure also to welcome you to the 2023 Hans Fischer Lecture. Um, really, this is an essential moment in our school's academic year, and it's part of our history and our commitment um, to being a really unique place of learning and connection. And I know you're going to be hearing this from Hans in a minute. Um, it's also really wonderful that this is a lectureship named after someone who devoted 52 years as a faculty member in various roles and really shaped um, Rutgers as it is today. So, so it's, a, it's an honor um, to have this, and it's exciting um, that he can attend as well. So hello in Zoom land. Uh, Providing a welcome to this lecture is, also, is a special treat also because it is an opportunity to be part of the nutritional sciences community, joined together in an annual tradition. Um, around a shared interest in learning new things. And as I reviewed the list of past lectures, it's like a departmental diary, um, a glimpse into your discourse as a, as a community. And today, as we gather to hear from Dr. Stover about enhancing the purpose of food, I look forward to hearing um, uh, learning things and also hearing the discussions that you will have. And while I'm here to welcome our guests and welcome this event, I also want to take this opportunity to thank the Department of Nutritional Sciences faculty, staff, students um, who, who make up that group, and alumni, um, and all your partners, um, who make up the Department of Nutritional Sciences. Um, life is really demanding right now, and there's so much going on in the world that for you to take this time and this commitment to running an event like this, that says a lot. You know, these kinds of events start getting planned, if not yesterday, definitely this afternoon, right? And it takes a lot to make these things happen and to bring everyone together uh, with uh, with the strike, um, with uh, the semester ending, with uh, just all of the things that are going on in life, it means a lot to bring you together. And I am really appreciative of everything that you're doing to, to keep this part of our important mission alive. So thank you um, to the department. And so with that, I will hand it back to Josh. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Lawson. I very much appreciate you being here today. Um, Fisher Lectureship honors the legacy of the founding chair of the Department of Nutrition in 1966, Dr. Hans Fisher. Dr. Fisher was hired as an assistant professor of nutritional biochemistry at Rutgers in 1954. His research in various animal models, including uh, chicks, rabbits, and humans, uh, provided fundamental insights into the roles of amino acids, vitamins, and fiber in metabolism, egg production, growth, wound healing, stress management, neurotransmitters and behavior in alcohol addiction and withdrawal, and cholesterol in atherosclerosis. It's upon this legacy and its many contributions to the Department of Nutritional Sciences and Rutgers University that we hold the Hans Fischer Lectureship. And it's my honor to let you know that Dr. Fischer is attending today via Zoom from his home in Boston. Please join me in acknowledging Dr. Fischer. Want to say a few words uh, from the what I call the God mic in the room? Yes, I would be very happy to do so. Okay, go ahead. Just to give everyone an opportunity to understand how this lectureship came about. In 1991, 32 years ago a small committee was asked 
to review the Department of Nutritional Sciences, which, as you heard, got started in 1966. And the chairman of that small committee was Dr. John Sati from the University of Wisconsin, who was an expert on vitamin K. And he recommended, after giving the department very high marks for its pedagogic, pedagogical and uh, research undertakings through all these years, recommended that it would be very appropriate to add a lecture which would bring outstanding scholars to Rutgers and to give the faculty, the students, postdocs an opportunity to hear such outstanding people once a year and at the same time also to honor me for my role at Rutgers University. And so that's why this came into being 32 years ago, and we've had many outstanding people, including some of my children who are researchers, and uh, of course today Dr. Patrick Stover. And so without any further ado, I turn this back to you so we can continue on to the lecture. Now, 
before I hand the podium over to Dr. Stover in preparing for today, I wanted to see if there were any connections between him and Dr. Fisher. So I looked through the literature, and um, I, here's, um, here's one of uh, Dr. Stover's paper. And I want to point out that he was working as a postdoc with Barry Shane, who many of us know as a longtime researcher in the area uh, at the University of Berkeley. Now, Barry Shane worked with ELR Stockstead, and it's one of the awards that, that has been awarded to Dr. Stover. And I went back to Stockstead's first paper that I could find online, and it was looking at uh, trying to figure out dietary water-soluble factors required in chicks. And what I can tell you is that there weren't any specific papers published between Dr. Fisher and Dr. Stockstead, but the work that Dr. Fisher did uh, early on in his career uh, actually used the same model of chicks. So, put that all together, we begin the separation between Dr. Stover and Dr. Fisher. And with that, I pass this over to Dr. Stover. And I knew some of you were in that room, what we're doing at AM, in terms of the interest of the building. So I intend to put those two together, and it makes sense in my mind, and we'll see if it makes sense in your mind. But part of this is because, and it was something that Bert Gardner, who was the guy who was director at Cornell, who hired me, who, from the very first year I was ever since a professor, he said, you know, don't be an idiot, so he said, you know, do your lab, do all that stuff. But you have to do service at the Land Grant University to national and international organizations so you bring the very best science to these other organizations that are involved in policy and so forth. So what I'm going to talk about today is going to mix both of those. It's informed both by my research, but also by work over the years related to Foley and fortification with the World Health Organization, with the CDC, National Academy, and other groups. So a lot of that really is what translated into what we're trying to do with a number of years. So we'll see if this makes sense or not. Hang on, I'm going to try it. Um, but enhancing the purpose of food is very interesting. You're seeing right now the USDA MLA, which all of these places now, and precision nutrition, they're seeing right now the food is medicine, the food is medicine, and all of this work done. But well, what this really is about is enhancing the purpose of food. And so, why do we have the food system we have today? That's the fundamental question. Why do we have that? The food system is the basis for, obviously, all of the nutrition that we have. And the food system we have today is intentional. It came out of the post-World War II era, where there was a lot of hunger coming out of the depression through the war in the United States. And there was an intentional decision made that hunger was unacceptable. It was a moral imperative that not only in the U.S., but around the world, we had to eliminate hunger. And because of that, we scaled an agricultural system to make hunger rare. And we did it by producing calories. Simple calculation. How many people in the world are there? How many calories do we need? We scaled agriculture toward that goal. And it was unbelievably successful. Since then, there's still hunger, but it's not because of the lack of food production. It's because of access issues and others. But that's why the equity food system we have today. That's why we have the economic model around food systems to make it cheap and affordable, low margins for farmers, but low cost. The name is more than, you know, the food costs less here in terms of percentage of income than any other country, et cetera, et cetera. So it was very intentional, and the purpose of the food system was to eliminate hunger. Now, at the same time going over to, there was a lot of efforts to learn about food and soldier performance and such and so forth and so on. But that wasn't the first thing that Josh was. The purpose of the food system was to eliminate hunger. He's over And if you look he's now, we still have to produce more food. The world population is growing. There's going to be another 2 billion people on this planet. You can see there with a million in China, and the United States. So we need to still produce more food, more calories, and more protein to feed people. But at the same time, we're seeing another problem. And that is, you see now right here, that the food system we have today makes people sick. Diet-related chronic disease is my 
biggest driver of health care wealth. Estimated somewhere between four and six trillion dollars a year in the U.S. economy. Nobody can afford those costs. What do we do about that? So we still have to throw more, but we have to do better. And of course, you've seen these facts. This is a fairly recent phenomenon, and it continues to accelerate. There you see the presence of type 219 from 2004 to 2019. This next slide is kind of easy because that can be so up. But you also see the obesity prevalence facts. But what you also can see from here is that the prevalence of obesity is not evenly distributed across the U.S. population. It is especially great in our underserved population. So if you want to lower health care costs and lower diet related chronic disease, if you all get health care costs, that's where you have to focus, because that's where the major problem is. And we also see how it affects on life expectancy for the first time. Life expectancy was increasing for decades. Now we're seeing since the pandemic decreases in life expectancy. And again, you're seeing it's not evenly distributed. You look at not this kind of way to Asian and compare that to some of the Native American Hispanic countries. So you now have this disparity as well in life expectancy that's continuing to grow. And we saw during the, the pandemic, a lot of the social unrest. This isn't sustainable. You can't have a functional society where you have this sort of disparity. And it's, again, especially acute in this country, and a lot of it is rooted in food and the food system we have today. This was recognized by Congress in 2020, the Agricultural Appropriations Bill. Very specific language that the USDA shall report back to Congress within 180 days how agriculture and food can be used to lower health care costs. Nobody knows how to deal with health care costs. Food's the major driver. Food has to be the solution. So how do we deal with this? So if you look, again, back at the World War II, this was the purpose of the food system. The purpose of the food system was to produce and overproduce in abundance food fiber and fuel for the economy and for the economy. Now you see the emphasis on food for health. What does that mean? You see a lot about the environmental footprint of agriculture. What does that mean? And we have to make sure that all of this is economically viable because if the economics don't work, something's going to work, right? And just the word about the environment, not only does agriculture have an environmental footprint, I'm not going to be talking about that. But what we're seeing is challenges with the environment and our ability to produce food. So the environment is changing. And the problem is it's changing with availability as well. It's more still happening. And this is a real problem. Things get hotter, we can breathe for hot. Things get colder, we can breathe for cold, right? Well, what we're getting is extreme variations in hot and cold, in wet and dry, in the same season. We can't deal with that. And it's beginning to affect yields, and it's beginning to affect our ability to produce food. So, climate variability is a huge issue. We also see it in healthcare problems. So, what do we do about that? And remember, the food system we have today, the economic model is perfect for, for its intent. The intent is to produce food that can be affordable and accessible by everybody. That's the economic problem. But what it does is it creates externalities in healthcare costs and environmental costs. And so you see some people who want to internalize the externality, right? Tax and soda, or this or that, which is most people tell you really bad economics. An economic model has to be geared towards the end. The end point is hunger reduction, that's the economic model we have. If it's health, we need a different economic model. And nobody knows what that is yet, but trying to external and internalize the externalities like you see in true policy and these other things are actually bad economics, a lot of economists will tell you. And we also see, because of the economic model of keeping margins really low for farmers, right, so that food is affordable, well, farmers are selling their land to development, to solar farms, because it's more profitable for them. And so the point is, the whole system's in a little bit of trouble, right? It's 
not making economic sense, it's not making environmental sense, and it's the uh, health care costs and, you know, having economies coming to these are problematic. And so the first thing is, not just means that we science feed the world because the population grows, but can we feed the world in a way that promotes health and is sustainable? And so the biggest challenge we see is you have these sort of four independent, complex dynamic systems. You have food, you have people, and you have health, you have the environment, you have the economics. And again, they were all aligned around the purpose of produce and hunger. All of those are going to be we're going to change the end point of human health, and how are we going to do that? And so, the way a lot of this started was back in 2017. The National Academy was asked by Congress to change the way that we do dietary weapons intakes. And if you want to look at dietary weapons intakes, this is that process. And we used to set them for hunger, if you will, hunger or hidden hunger. That is, how do you maintain out? How do you get enough of all the vitamins and nutrients and such so that you have sufficient amounts of hunger? And Congress said, well, you know, we don't have scurvy in Pirates are all gone and this and that. The problem we have is chronic disease. So change the outcome from hunger to health. And so I was part of this committee that began to look at how we develop a framework for changing the endpoint of our central defense system from hunger to health. And of course, this is really, really challenging. Because number one, hunger, or lack of an essential nutrient in hunger, is a one-to-one -one part of weight. There's one cause, generally, for health use. You're not getting enough of it. And so, most of the population responds in a similar way. If you use a health outcome, it's much more complex. Because number one, diet's not the only driver of chronic disease. It's a combination right your stress, your sleep, your exercise, etc., etc. And so we have to think completely different about what does food mean, what do nutrients mean in terms of chronic disease reduction? We also have to think more in systems because health or disease is not related to one nutrient. I mean, you talk about chronic disease, that's to do with network failure, that's to do with accelerated feeding, resource consumption. So we have to think very carefully. But also, what people don't appreciate is there are a lot of non essential bioactive food components that promote health. Now, they're not essential, so they never had a PRI before, but now they have a PRI. You can show an individual nutrient reduces the risk of chronic disease. It then will get a PRI. It'll then feed into the dietary guidelines for Americans. There's a dual food systems program, so it's a big opportunity for producers if there are food components in what they grow, but they have a health effect. And people who can take advantage of that. And the other reason, as Francis Collins says, is responding to non response. People react differently to food in that in the diet to be related. Not everyone responds. So again, that is the biological premise of precision nutrition. It's well supported by evolutionary biology. When we look at genomes, human genomes, we look at variation within human genomes. And which genes are, are, are evolving quickly, which genes haven't evolved much at all. It's those related to food and nutrition that have evolved the fastest, giving us the most variation we have in the population. That and immunity. Because the population is more all over the world, we have to adapt to those foods. If they didn't adapt, they didn't try, they didn't expand. And so that's why you see two of the greatest selective pressures in genetic variation we have today in the population is due to, again, food and beauty. Just want to highlight this study, which I think is great. It was a great deal of my colleague today mentioned a few years ago. Just quickly, he did a study where he took four different mouse trains and bred mouse trains, 
But before the diet, age them out and ask the question, what's the best diet? And he measured everything. Finally, let everybody have the genetics and tag. Look at mutation rates. Look at biomarkers of everything. Look at disease. Look at this. You can actually point out the better than I know. Depending on what mastery and what outcome you were interested in. That's the challenge we have, and it models really well in mind. So how do we begin to think about this? Because we know one size does not fit all the strength of how it's done in the diet and disease relationship. So what, how are we going to get there? What's the pathway going to be? And what I'd like to share with you is a little bit of the folic acid story. Folic acid and neurotuplicates. Because the last National Academy report, I showed you the chronic disease framework report. They use folic acid as an example birth effect prevention of the things we have to think about in terms of using food for health outcomes rather than functional or adequate outcomes. So this was a huge success. There is no success story in nutrition like this. But what we knew is that there is something called moral tooth effects. The birth effect that happens very, very early in pregnancy, often before a woman even knows she's pregnant, when you have closure in oral tooth. It's one of the fastest times of self proliferation in your entire life when the normal epithelium has to expand and close. If during this critical window it does not reach closure, the normal tooth will remain open throughout that, the life of that individual. That individual will be paralyzed from the site of the lesion down. If it doesn't close in the head, that's going to be lethal. So these are extremely debilitating persons. And what we know is we know it has a genetic component because it runs in families. We know it runs in families, but we also know that there was a nutrition component with this as well. We'll talk about that. But the important thing I want you to know is that about 2,500 affected births a year. Small number, big effect. High health care costs, big effect. But it was known that low COVID status increased those pregnancies. Most women that they become efficient fully are not rich, but some people are. Who are they? We don't know. That's the challenge. Well, what we know back in the 60s, and we noticed that women who presented with a child with an oral tube effect tended to show biomarkers of the air and fully metabolism. This later done with the clinical trials in the early 90s, and I was part. When you gave women supplemental oral gases, you were able to reduce the risk as much as 70 percent. That then went to public health recommendations. If you're going to get pregnant, have both gases. Well, most pregnancies in this country are unplanned, so that didn't work, right? So that led to a fortification of the U.S. food supply with folic acid for the purpose of reducing the time that this is birth defect. So what's interesting about this, this is the first time we use food policy not because there was an efficiency in the population of that vitamin. There was not. There was no public efficiency to warrant fortification. And we know fortification is done because of that. This was done for a medical purpose, using food as medicine, using good behavior to help 2,500 birds every year and to prevent that birth defect. And everywhere where fortification happened, it's been successful. And if you look here, these are countries that are fortifying right now, which is quite a problem. This is actually one of the things we And if it's dark blue, it's mandatory. If it's light blue, it's voluntary. But you see some white there, especially in Europe, they don't fortify. So why do you have something that's cheap, it's pennies, to put public gas in the food supply? It works, works everywhere you would, but some countries don't do it. Why is that? And that's again because of a lot of nuances. Number one, it's the first fortification they should get there. Not meant to remedy the nutritional deficiency, it wasn't there. It was to prevent this first. Number two, it exposes everyone for 2,500 births. Right? And so some of that, well, it's hypothetical. Well, maybe there's another small group that improves risk for this. Right? That's public health. Public health assumes, but it's a risk analysis. It's not do no harm. But that's a question people ask. We don't know the mechanism. We 
have no idea how total gas is for mass production. All we know is we have a prime box where you get total gas from a clinical trial, you win the food, and you're going to achieve the works. But we don't know what this connection is, and there's always concern that it may be increasing cancer risk for us. Again, there's no strong evidence for it, but it's been raised, and you can make you know, a lot of arguments for that. Um, so there are observational studies that raise concerns, concerned about models that get metabolized. But all of this exacerbates the common concerns of unintended consequences. So think about trying to use a food supply or a well-raised chronic disease. You're going to run into the same thing. People respond differently to food. And so this idea of how do you take a food supply that everybody is exposed to and manage risk-benefit, or be able to identify and classify people based on precision for what diet is best for them. It just illustrates part of the issue. And what we have been doing in our lab is trying to understand what this mechanism is. Because if you want to understand how something works at a molecular level, then you can begin to find biomarkers <coughs> and you can classify people and then target in a way with precision those who need the intervention or those that need whatever the dietary exposure they need to prevent um, the chronic disease. So God feels that this is one part of the metabolism. I don't want to go into this too much, just to say that all it is a B vitamin, and it just carries <coughs> and activates one part of the formate and puts them into purines for purine biosynthesis to make amyloid and three methylene almost the thing that binds the methylene it's a network, it's interconnected, but you just get these three elements, right? It is a tightly integrated network. If you tickle this network over here, you'll see your percussions over here. So it is tightly, um, there's a lot of crosswalk between these patterns. But what we found that during S phase, and there's a number of wonderful students who did this, during S phase, this pathway gets this sumo tag. Sumo is probably a peptide that comes in on the ubiquitin. And it goes into the nucleus, it forms a metabolic complex right at sites of DNA synthesis. So that two base is made on site, on demand, at the replication point, where DNA synthesis is prepared. So it is the only base of DNA that is made on site, on demand. And this is unique to higher mammals. Yeast don't do this, yeast leave it in the cytoplasm. Only higher eukaryotes put this pathway into the nucleus. And we were really interested to find that is. And we also began to knock out some of these enzymes and so forth and so on. And when we did, guess what? We got more supercells. When we knock out SHNT1, we just need to let, knock out one copy, not both. We get about 10% penetrant more supercells. You see there, the head never exploded. So that led us to believe then that this pathway in the nucleus. This pathway in the nucleus that takes tetrahydrofolate to make 510 tetrahydrofolate, give an activated one part, and give an E1 to make amyloid, the thing goes in the DNA. Somewhere in here, you have risk of a neural tube defect, which you described it. How does it happen? Well, if you don't have enough of the ET base, cells grow slowly. That's known. Finding it would be great when they cell growth, less proliferation. We also know that if you don't make DT, DE1 people accumulate, it will become triphosphorylated, and it will get disincorporated into DNA. So now we need to slow proliferation, we begin to get uracil in DNA. And what's the uracil doing in DNA? Well, it's prepared, but does it have other types of functions as well? But somewhere in this pathway is, we believe, the ideology of more two defects. And we really like this mouse model. Is there were about 200 mouse models that give you moral two defects. But if you knock out any team that affects proliferation, you're getting moral two defects. But these mimic these or phenocopy the human NTDs. There's a variant NSH10T1 that inhibits nuclear influence. It doesn't totally inhibit it, but it decreases it. It's a risk factor for moral two defects. If you look here, we just need to knock out one of those copies to increase the moral two the majority of NTDs are neutrophilic responsive, 
thousands of public gas in response. We price are fully for clean. We don't get all the fuel tracks. We have to make them fully efficient. If we take a normal mass, we're allowed right now to make them fully efficient. We're going to show no animal They have to be sensitized. This gene sensitizes them. Low and variable penetrance for both. And a subtle alteration of metabolism. When we look at these lights, and we look at all the biomarkers and serum that are related to polio, this and that, and John Winterton, there is no serum indicator for neural tubes to affect risk in ordinary polio metabolism in these lights. So we think it's a great model. So I just want to review what I just said here, is that at site the DNA replicates, we showed that there's a multi enzyme complex that takes time to go but I didn't tell you, the sensation T1 is the anchor. It's the step. It finds gladly like a rock inside the DNA synthesis. You then have to get pseudo labeled, pseudo labeled filter that holds them all together. Um, and you get this metabolic complex that with SHM T serving both as a catalyst to find one part of the unit, but it's redundant that this enzyme is also to find one part of the unit. This is forming this material in different sources. But they're all together here at the end of the if we not know this in 10 one this complex breaks up, and these enzymes are just all floating around in the nucleus, not in the complex. We've been able to show all that. So in order to get a mechanism, we want to ask the question, what are the elements of s one that cause the NCB? Is it its catalytic activity? Is it its ability to find folate? And that's important. Because when you have enzymes that have a complex, you can show that that folate is challenged from enzyme to enzyme. It's not, it's not a great solution. It's actually transferred from active site to active site. So we wanted to say, well, is it a channeling effect, fully finding activity, or is it the step away? That's important. And so what we did was make the following enzymes, the mutations and enzymes. Here we have a wild type SHMT1, this is a crystal structure. Here's folate. We have a fully finding site. This tyrosine here is critical for folate binding because you get resonance overlap between this tyrosine and the paramedic that's the blue male to try to pull it. Essentially, a stack of interaction here that really binds uh, the Riley Fry binding. If you look here at the active site, you have vitamin B6 here, if you're not the phosphate, these two residues here are really important for catalytic activity. So we took one mouse, we did cyclic immunogenesis, and we knocked out its ability to bind. Here up the plastic, get the enzyme intact, get bones, and do everything it's supposed to be a catalyst. We took another one where we also not we kept this uh, disruptive catalytic site, but then we also knocked out this tyrosine so they came back fully in. These enzymes express in life just fine. They form the metabolic complex, as you can see. I'm sorry, I'm just reviewing here what we have. It might be a big wild type mouse that has all the activity, a knockout mouse that has no protein, and then we have one, two mice, both don't have catalytic activity, one can bind both and one can't. And again, they, they express the spine mice at the appropriate levels. You can do cool down by the gene, they're still in the complex. They are perfectly fine proteins, they just either can catalyze reactions or they can't bind. So we took our mites here. This is our knockout mites. Put them on a fully efficient diet. This one here has no activity and it can't bind folate. This one can bind folate with no catalytic activity. We keep the mites, the female mites, fully efficient. We make them and we look for more tooth effects and look at what we find. This is the knockout mouse. It shows the number of NPDs is about 10%. That's what we always see. We look at the enzyme that's intact, but can't use serine to one part of the source, no activity, same effect. So if you're not going to the activity, you get the same thing as knocking out the protein. But if you now knock out the activity and the ability to bind the folate, resorptions double, NTDs go up by 30%, and severity of NTDs, I'll show you what that means in a minute, skyrockets. <coughs> So having a protein that can't bind folate is worse than not having the protein at all. This is what I mean by severity of NPDs. The 
these are unaffected mites. This is the simple exencephaly. This is what we call granular right speech. The head didn't close, but the ear didn't get the spinal cord. The lesion was all the way down the spinal cord. That's a catastrophic noise. Those are more prevalent. So what does this mean? What this means is that if you're not going to listen to the team, these enzymes are still floating around, but you can make sufficient time to wait to get mice, some of them will have more tooth effects. If you put an inactive protein in here, you get the same effect. But if you put one that can't find folate, the phenotype is worse in both penetrance and severity, telling us that folate is channeled here. And if you impair the ability of this enzyme to find folate, you essentially constipate the whole system, and it's worse than not having any protein at all. So why is that important? It's important now that we're beginning to understand mechanism at a higher level, and hopefully be able to find some marker again that we can find out in humans and be able to identify humans where the defect is in terms of metabolism that's leading to the neural tissue. Second question we want to ask is, does your soul accumulation impact NTD risk? And so if you don't have enough T-base, you're going to incorporate a U, the U is going to deal with the DNA strain, there's going to be an enzyme, Duracell DNA glycosylase is going to excise that Duracell, close the adjacent site, and then you're going to get uh, cleavage of the DNA backbone and then repair. So this is what happens when you misinterpret Duracell DNA, and that's the only molecular phenotype we see with this site, is they have more Duracell DNA, they have more repair. So we want to ask the question, was it the Duracell DNA that's causing the neural tube effect, or is it the repair of the Duracell that's causing the neural tube so we took mice that were UHD negative, they can't repair the internet. We took our mice that don't have SHMT, they incorporate your silicon DNA. And then we cross these so that these mice are going to accumulate your silicon DNA and not be able to repair it. And these are the data. Again, if we look at SHMT no mice, 11% more tube defects. If we look at those that can't repair UHD1, no more tube defects. If we go and we cross these two, we lower the incidence of neural tube defects by about 60 to 70 percent. So this tells us that it's the DNA repair that's causing the neural tube defects. It's not a proliferative effect. It's a fact that you're still being misincorporated into the DNA because you don't have enough of the enzyme, that you're still prepared, and it's the act of repairing at least sometimes the apoptosis and other effects, that is the source of the neural tube effects. So neural tube effects are due to effects of hyperactive DNA repair. And that's essentially the best. So how does this relate to the terrible precision nutrition? What the folic acid story illustrates is number one, you know, there's going to be benefit and risk. Might be so much for vacation. Some people are benefiting, but others may be a proven risk. And so, how do you tailor an entire agriculture and food system when there's a heterogeneous population of people that respond differently when you have that health outcome? How do we deal with the issue of population versus precision? What does that even mean for dietary guidelines if people respond to react different to food in terms of that? We you know what they do. What are the evidence and standards we're going to use for benefit and risk? If neural tooth effects we see from the clinical trials we have the benefit, there's no real evidence for there's clinical evidence for risk, but how do you deal with how uncertainty and how is the public going to react? We need biomarkers. We need to understand and be able to get that human individual what their risk is and how food can mitigate that risk. And we do not have the biomarkers to do that. But we need that both to identify and classify people who respond to different dietary exposures uh, so that they have the agency to make the right choice. Issues of penetrance, of expressivity of the effects that they're in on people. And of course, the public trust. Because right now, we don't do really good with public trust in the Institute survey as nutrition science researchers. We have to get this right with this precision nutrition. Nobody's going to listen to it. So lots of issues there that we have to solve if we're going to move forward both precision nutrition and food medicine. 
But on the other hand, we have the tremendous capacity to do whatever we want to the person. We can use CRISPR, we can change pathways, we can put high concentrations of metabolites, vitamins, and nutrients in, take them out. We can do whatever we want to do if we can get over the barriers. It's not the technology or the barriers, it's the regulation and the acceptance of those barriers and knowing what we want. We still have to know what we want out of the food system that's going to give us uh, those health outcomes. So what we've done at a m and some of this came from support from the state of an 18 billion recurring uh, appropriation and then matched back with federal funds and other funds, to set up an institute that we call the Institute for Advancing Health through Agriculture, where we sort of going to solve these problems we have to deal with the agriculture food system as a system. You can't do nutrition over here and soil science over here and so forth. It all has to work together. We need to take every opportunity we can to achieve that outcome of human health. And so we developed audiences that we were interested in, production side of the ag chain consumers, put this under the umbrella of the Institute for Advanced Health to Agriculture, they actually have a terrible name. And I was talking to the New York Times reporter, so that's a terrible name that the name is used. So it was totally stolen from the New York Times reporter. Um, we also, the other third important um, um, you know, audience that we were interested in, that is decision makers. That is policy makers. If you look right now, decisions around the food supply we're not driven by science. We're driven by preferences, values, and beliefs. And it's a big problem. And so what we have done, happy monoclonal plan are very common in the medical community, is an evidence center. We have created the first agriculture, food, and nutrition scientific evidence center. So if any person, decision maker, whether it's a member of Congress, the Ag Committee, you know, CEO of a company, has a question of what is the state of knowledge regarding any question around the food system. We will do that evidence synthesis for them, combine the data, set the evidentiary standards, and give them the answer in terms of the health effects, the environmental effects, and the economic effects. And so we're building this in Fort Worth. We haven't even announced yet, and we have over $3 million in contracts already from just the beginning of the year. The only one in the world, you're, you're going to see other people begin to copy already. Uh, but this is going to be really important in moving agriculture from really driven by preferences, values, beliefs to something that is science driven. So, this is the institute in the way that we have designed this. And we think of ourselves as an Uber or an Airbnb, that is, we don't want a lot of infrastructure. We want to use our resources to address big problems, focus on technology that are going to transform a particular area of the food system, and we bring the very best people with the resources we have to address those problems. So that's the approach we use. And we created three hubs. One, of course, is precision nutrition. That's fundamental. If you're going to have health is the end point of the food system and dietary guidance, you need precision and we need to figure out how to do this. So we are working on technology that we hope will do for nutrition what things like the Oura Ring and the Apple, and the Apple Watch have done for exercise science. So we're working with those technologies and we have collaboration with all the world and the Intel. We have over at this end what we're calling responsive agriculture. And we will, I'll uh, find that in a minute. But agriculture has always been responsive to the end point. When hunger was the end point, agriculture responded and dealt with that. Well, how is, how is the food system going to be responsive to human health? And do it in a way that's sustainable, both environmentally and economically. And we have a number of initiatives around there, I'll speak to one of them. But both of them feed into what we call healthy living hub. And that is, how do we use the important translational research in communities to do this work? Control feed crowds aren't healthy. They're good to understand scientific questions. But this work has to be done with three living people. People need agency, make choices, and add the knowledge they need to an act when it's precision nutrition. So 
can we intentionally put this, these two in here? This is the food environment. This is an individual and what they need in terms of their health. Both feed into what we call our healthy living hub. We have seven mobile laboratories, much like the CDC laboratories, that's the next generation of the CDC that gives their footprint of their mobile vehicle. We can go anywhere in Texas to be fully equipped with laboratories, freezers, all sorts of assessment to do studies that make responsive agriculture. So I want to talk about one initiative we're doing in response to agriculture, and hopefully some of you can engage with us. So as I mentioned earlier, you're here people of these expectations in the food system. Human health. Some people focus on environment, right? We need to lower the environmental footprint. We all need to eat crickets or seaweeds or things like this. But people are going to do that, right? They're not going to do that. And the whole economic problem. Well, right now we have an economic system that is based on hunger. How do we move that to health? And how do we do it in a way that's going to be economically sustainable so that agriculture is sustainable so that young people want to go into agriculture and be farmers, et cetera, et cetera? So we want to define responsive agriculture in a particular way. We fundamentally say that, yes, the outcomes are the environment, they are health, they are economics, but they're not only human health has to come first. The food isn't about health. You're not going to get public support for it. You're not, I mean, that's the purpose of food. I mean, it's a major purpose is to promote health. So what is an agriculture system that supports health? And once we define what that means, how do we do that in a way that is economically and environmentally sustainable? But we're not calling them equal. We're saying human health, figure that out, and then how do we go about um, adapting everything else? We're U.S. focused. In tax for Texas. Um, so we recognize the food system is global, this and that, but we're really focused on the U.S. food system. So we started out and I came up with a partnership with the Chicago Council for Global Affairs. And in November, we had the under secretary of the USDA join us, and she's right, she's right there. But we got people from the House Ag Committee there. We had a lot of the leaders in ag policy. And leading producer groups, leading public health groups, and began to develop like this idea of how do we achieve human health through response to agriculture. Because again, health is about individual agency, individual biology, but it's also about the food environment that's surrounding us. And so this kicked off this event, um, which now is leading to the next phase, which we're going to roll out probably within two weeks. So we are going to continue our, our uh, partnership with the Chicago Council on a two-year project, and that is we are bringing together you know, leading experts in these three bids. We are going to have a committee on reducing diet-related chronic disease, and really ask the question, what are the priorities we need? So things we can do now, immediate, short-term, long-term, changes we need, or information we need, research we need, to make agriculture the solution to diet related chronic disease. We know there are things we can do now. And then what are the barriers? Are they regulatory barriers? Are they elastic will? Is, is, is it resources? What are the barriers? And so we're going to be putting out a call soon for experts to join this committee. We're going to be writing white papers on this. Um, and they're going to be feeding into what's not on here is a task force that's going to integrate and communicate findings across these groups. This group is going to talk to this group here about, well, how do we then create a food system that, that is going to support them now and do it in a way that, again, is both environmentally and economically viable, considering urban, suburban, considering technologies. What do we need to do to modify the food system to achieve this goal? And then a third one on securing nutrition equity. Again, most of the related chronic disease within the underserved population. How do we ensure that the information that we get from these first two bids then is actually going to benefit those most of the those most of risk, those who where you see most of the health problems? So this is our first little schematic here on top of the pyramid is chronic disease. This then feeds back to these two committees. 
And so we're really excited about this. It's a very good support. We have a built um, in terms of the ad committees, what they want to see done. Um, and so we'll be doing a lot of work in Washington in terms of moving this information through as fast as we can. But our goal is to move the farm bill, if you will, or agriculture. And again, we told us before, Green Revolution was all about using technology to end hunger. So we have done it. We just need to do it again with what that new end is. We need to human health, and we need to have the economic and the environmental models that are going to support that. So with that, the research we do here, all of the research I showed you is Kendra Tiani's. She just defended her thesis. Two days ago, I went out to a great town yesterday. It's a great way to do it. She did all that. And that's what I told you about. This is my research group. And at IHK, I am just so fortunate to work with two of the most brilliant people I know. Reagan Bailey runs a procedural nutrition program, which included her education in Purdue um, a year ago. And Rebecca Stegan runs a healthy living house. She is the world's best at taking any sort of a health program, whether it's an extension program or whatever. A, a randomized control trial that is supported within the community, sustainable, and everything else. She's absolutely fantastic. So the three of us lead the institute together. I'm not only, not only the director, but in fact, I just take orders from those two. Um, and we value our, our collaboration with the Chicago Council. So with that, I thank you. I hope that was somewhat coherent. Um, but that's sort of the approach that we are taking to deal with this big challenge of how we make agriculture and nutrition a solution to human health. All right, everybody. Um, we have one more order of business before we're done. Come up here. So we have this. Uh, Class to present. It says the Hans Fisher Lectureship, Enhancing the Purpose of Food, uh, given to Patrick J. Stover, PhD. That's it for today. Have a good rest of the day and a good weekend, everybody. Thanks to all for coming. Thank you all.